Hey everyone, Scott from Skullbrain here and welcome to Skullbrain TV. And in this episode, we continue our journey along the Ancestral Trail. When he who is the Chosen One shall tread upon the ancient path and battle there to overcome the forces of the dark. The Ancestral Trail, an epic story of myths, magic, and monsters. Book One, The Moss Beast, in the grip of the Slime River Ghoul. Okay, so in the last episode, we met our hero Richard, who's been brought to the Ancestral World to balance the forces of good and evil. He met his travel companion Orkin, and in this episode, they begin their journey down the Ancestral Trail. Let's get to it. On the first day, should evil e'er the victor be, and darkness fall upon the land, a chosen one from far will come, who sees in dark and light. On the first day, herein points the way, to cross the river he follows the flow. From air and water danger, safety lies in earth below. At Paths Inn lies the slender way. A hidden weakness saves the day. Deeper and deeper into the forest they went. As they pushed their way through the thick undergrowth, Orkin kept Richard spellbound with stories of his amazing bravery during the final battle and of his escape from the Evil One's forces. Showing Richard a deep, jagged wound on his right arm, Orkin recalled how he was almost overcome by three of the Evil One's soldiers. They attacked me from all sides, and one of them managed to slice through my fighting armour, he said. Ugh, Richard shuddered, looking at the deep scar. I bet it bled a lot. Mmm, it did, Orkin said, rubbing over the scar. I was lucky to escape alive. Many common beasts and other creatures died in that final battle. Many more were captured. Like those before them, they would fall under the influence of the Evil One's power. Orkin's eyes grew sad as he remembered the fortress under siege. Inside, they were starving to death. Outside, beasts who were once friends and neighbours were lining up in their heavy armour and horned helmets waiting for their new master to order the attack. First, the attackers shot burning arrows over the perimeter wall, Orkin recalled. There was no way of putting out the fires which blazed on almost every roof. We'd run out of water days before. The whole place was in flames. Then we heard a great clamour. The Evil One's forces were among us. They had dug their way under the battlements and attacked in force. Smaller beasts were just trampled underfoot. Rich's eyes widened as Orkin stopped speaking. Orkin seemed totally lost in thought. How did you get away from the three who attacked you? Richard asked curiously. One of them I felled with my sword as he swung his spiked mace at me. His helmet and chain mail covered him almost completely, but I found a chink near his neck. As he went down, his mace caught my arm and cut me almost to the bone. The other two were a bit slow and I managed to get both of them in the belly. Now any survivors are scattered around the land and I must join forces with them. There is still some hope. Orkin fell silent. The going was becoming trickier. They were in some kind of valley where the ground was wetter and slippery with damp moss. The forest itself was thinner and large chunks of granite poked from the ground, their sides dark with moisture. The two slipped and slid their way down to the valley floor, where a fast-flowing stream wound its way down a rocky gully. Wait. What's that? Orkin held up his hand and Richard skidded to a halt. There's somebody down there. Listen. I can't hear anything, Richard whispered. Listen hard. Above the gurgle of flowing water, Richard heard a distant soaring noise. Come on, let's see what it is, Orkin said, starting off towards the sound. With Richard close on his heels, Orkin ducked and darted along the valley. 
halting every now and then with one ear cocked. Finally they located the source of the noise. It came from behind a large rock, the size of a small cottage that stood by a stream. As they peered around the rock, they saw an old dwarf-like figure leaning against it, snoring deeply. Before Richard could say anything, Orkin kicked the little dwarf and toppled him sideways. Who are you and what are you doing here, Orkin demanded. The little man woke with a start, then eyes wide with fear, he turned to Orkin. I am Melek of Antona, the dwarf said. I was a scribe in the library in the ancient city, but now... The little man broke off and hung his head dejectedly. He looked up at Orkin with wounded arrogance. Then he saw Richard. The dwarf seemed to lose all fear. You're... you're the chosen one! He exclaimed, staring at Richard's eyes. How do you know about that? Richard asked. Unstrapping an old book from his shoulders, Malik propped it in front of him against the root of a tree. The book was covered in faded red leather and bound with a hefty brass lock. This is our ancient book of prophecies. Melik said, opening it up. I managed to rescue it from the library's vaults just before the city fell. It tells how the Chosen One will come and save us at our time of need. Richard leaned forward, intrigued. He quickly told Melik about his meeting with Golan and asked, What else is in the book? Who can tell? Melik shrugged. There's a lot, but it's all rhyme and riddle. Only the Chosen One can puzzle the meaning. Even the Guardians could not unravel its secrets completely. What does it say? Richard insisted, leaning to take the book from Melik. Not too much, Melik said, gripping the book protectively. I'll read you the first riddle. Should evil air the victor be and darkness fall upon the land, a chosen one from far will come who sees in dark and light. On the first day, Heron points the way to cross the river he follows the flow. From air and water danger, safety lies in earth below. At paths and lies the slender way. A hidden weakness saves the day. Richard was completely puzzled. He may be the chosen one, but this riddle meant nothing to him. He peered over Malik's shoulder and read the words again and again. Well, Richard said at last, darkness falling upon the land must refer to the evil one gaining power. Here and points the way could mean something in the book. He stopped to think again. First we have to find a river. I bet this stream leads into one. Let's follow it. Suddenly he felt a little more in control and he marched off with new determination. The three followed the stream through the valley. Sometimes the going was easy, sometimes it was treacherous, as they jumped from slippery rock to slippery rock. Eventually the valley broadened, the forest became even thinner, and a wide clearing opened in front of them. There, Richard shouted, pointing triumphantly. The narrow stream widened and opened out into a river that looped lazily through the plain. Beyond the river lay red, thinly grassed ground dotted with clumps of huge boulders, which looked just like little villages. Well, crossing the river will be easy, Hawkins said. There's some stepping stones leading straight over. Richard had not noticed the stones, which marched evenly in narrow islands across the river. As the three wandered closer, Richard could see that the stones were a dark shade of green, and the water around them looked slimy. As Richard peered into the gooey mulch, he heard a steady drone which grew louder and louder. Grab Fritz! Orkin cried, get under cover, quick! Grapefruits? Richard questioned as he ran alongside Orkin. No, grab Fritz, Orkin said. They live in the forest. They fly in swarms and can suck you dry in seconds. When they've finished with your blood, they go onto your bone marrow. Luckily, they've got dreadful eyesight. So long as we're hidden, we'll be okay. Remember the prophecy? Richard interrupted. Safety lies in the earth below. Even as he spoke, the Grapfruits emerged from the forest behind them. Instantly, Orkin dived into a thorny bush to their left. Melik looked around in panic and then disappeared after him. Richard was left alone. The Grapfruits were bearing down on him and there seemed to be no refuge left for him. The buzzing noise was deafening. The tunic, Richard thought suddenly. Golan said it would conceal me. Richard quickly pulled up the hood. For an instant, everything went hazy, and then his vision cleared. He could see the Grapfruits approaching. He did not feel at all invisible. Anxiously, he clutched the amulet that Golan had given him. 
The Grapfruit swarmed over him and hovered around the bush where Orkin and Melik were hiding. The creatures seemed confused, and they darted off in different directions. The air was filled with a rustling drone. Suddenly Richard felt a tickle in his nose. He was going to sneeze. He tried to stop himself but could not. It was the loudest sneeze he ever heard. Instantly one of the Grapfruits swerved towards him. It hung right in front of his face. Richard watched in horror as the Grapfruit's mouth swelled and a long, sharp, needle-like object slid out, jabbing hopefully right in front of his left eye. Richard recoiled instinctively. The Grapfruit could not see him under the tunic, but clearly it could hear every sound. Then the ordeal, which seemed to last an eternity, was over. The Grapfruit suddenly gave up, as if on command. They bunched together and droned back to the trees. Orkin was the first to emerge from hiding. That was a close one. We'd better move fast, he told Melek as the dwarf appeared from the bush. Richard flung back the hood of his tunic. Again, there was a brief blurring before everything came back into focus. Come on, Orkin said. We'll use the stepping stones to cross the river. We don't want to wait here for the Grapfritz to come back again. Melek held up his small hand. Uh, the prophecy said nothing about stepping stones. I think we're meant to go under the river. Perhaps we can find some sort of tunnel? Under? Go under the river, Orkin scoffed. Are you mad? Why should we waste time looking for a tunnel when we can walk across here? Well, that's what the riddle suggests, Melik retorted. Think of the words, earth, below, hidden. Look, the Grapfritz might be back any second, Richard interrupted. We've got to get on our way. I don't see anything wrong with the stepping stones. I say we use them. Well, I don't, Melek said huffily. I'm going to stay on the path to see if there's a tunnel up ahead. All right, Richard said, you follow the path. If you find another way, we'll meet you on the other side. Yet as he spoke, Richard sensed that he heard Golan's voice warning him against this route. No, it can't be, Richard thought to himself. And shaking his head in dismissal, he headed towards the stones, with Orkin following close behind. Melek, meanwhile, jogged down the path towards an old tree. He wondered if he was making a fool of himself. He had not thought about what he might find, but whatever he had hoped for did not seem to be here. The path stopped abruptly beneath the tree. Beyond it lay nothing but water. Upriver, he saw Richard and Orkin stepping gingerly on the first slimy stone. Melek tried to peer over the bank. He lowered himself over the edge, but the bank was steeper than he thought. Within seconds, he was sliding out of control towards the water. He grabbed out to save himself. Melek's hand closed around tree roots that snaked out of the earth. Hanging there, he was amazed to see that what had saved his life was not a root at all. It was a rope. An old piece of rope covered in mud hidden against the dark earth of the bank and the tree's spindly roots. If he needed further confirmation that he was on the right track, the rope provided it. Gripping onto the rope and wriggling in midair, Melly got another surprise. Deep in the bank he saw a hole. A tunnel under the river, he thought to himself. Melik wormed his way down the rope until, almost on the ground, it suddenly went slack in his hands. He landed clumsily by the tunnel's entrance. As the rope slithered down on top of him, Melik thanked his lucky stars that it had not given way higher up. A hidden weakness saves the day, he thought aloud. Age and the elements had taken their toll on the rope, but it had saved him from a nasty fall. Melik felt an odd compulsion to take it with him. He coiled it into a tight circle and gripping it in his hand, started down the tunnel. He ought to have been frightened, but somehow the river itself seemed scarier than the unknown possibilities ahead. It was slushy underfoot, but he could see fairly well. Light filtered down from the entrance and there was a faint glow of sunshine at the other end. He hurried along, stooping to avoid the muddy ceiling and pleased that the river was not too wide. From above, he felt, rather than heard, a curious scraping. Something was trying to dig down to get at him. He skittled and shuffled in the mud as fast as he could. Malik's heart seemed to be pounding in his ears. To his relief, the tunnel came out on dry land a little way from the bank. He emerged, mud-stained but triumphant, and looked for Richard and Orkin. What he saw rooted him to the ground. The two had made good going, but like Melik, they were glad the river was not too wide. Halfway across, they had both become nervous about the water. There was something odd about it. It was too still, too dark, too ominous. 
I don't like this, Richard said. Neither do I, Walken agreed. Move faster. Look, Richard suddenly halted. There's Melik. He must have found his tunnel after all. So get a move on, Orkin said. This river gives me the creeps. Even as Orkin spoke, the water began to boil around them. The stones beneath their feet shook. Suddenly, the river seemed to be flowing backwards. A small wave was headed upstream towards them, discoloring the water with more paler green slime, which smelled horrid. Richard started to lose his footing as the stones rose out of the water, throwing him and Orkin into the slimy mess. Instantly, he realised they were not stones at all, but giant scales on the back of something that was alive and rising higher into the air. Spluttering and gasping for breath, Richard and Orkin tried to swim for the shore, but the water had thickened into a rank stew that made movement all but impossible. The more they thrashed about, the tighter it gripped their limbs. Richard was a good swimmer, but he did not seem to make any headway. It was all he could do to keep his head above the gooey water. As for Orkin, he was floundering. Keep still, Richard shouted. The more you struggle, the sooner you'll sink. Rather than keeping still, Orkin redoubled his efforts. Looking round, Richard saw why. Downstream, the water was bubbling like a giant jacuzzi. Then its raging surface erupted to reveal bit by horrible bit, the most frightening creature Richard had ever seen in his life. First to emerge was the top of the beast's head, dripping with slimy moss. Then came a pair of small, beady eyes, followed by nostrils that snorted water in all directions. Worst of all was the mouth, a huge, gaping hole fringed with an array of razor-sharp fangs. Water poured from it in torrents, and Richard could just make out chunks of decaying flesh clinging to the creature's teeth. Richard gaped in horror as he saw the creature's long, raking talons, which oozed with fresh mud. Then, in a flash, he realised the beast must use its claws to pull itself along the riverbed. Somehow Richard knew this fact was the key to saving their lives. But how? He and Orkin were still stuck at the monster's mercy. Or were they? There was something wrong here, but what was it? As his mind raced, the monster spoke. Who dares for the waters I protect? The vile moss beast's words were accompanied by huge clouds of steam and a dank odour of decay. Its voice had a rasping, menacing tone. Feel the fear! You have transgressed on my domain and I shall destroy you! But we're only crossing this river. We mean you no harm. Who are you? Richard stammered. The moss beast growled deeply as it eyed Richard. All of a sudden it gave out a blood-curdling scream. Do you not know of Suma and the river she guards? Richard's eardrums felt as if they were about to burst. His head was ringing. Then the monster turned towards him. The huge head leered at him, and Richard suddenly realised what his brain had been trying to tell him. If her claws were above water, she could not move. Not at least if his guess about how she dragged herself through the mud was correct. If they were going to make a move, now was the time. But what move could they possibly make? Melik had made the decision for them. He too had been transfixed by the appearance of Sumar, but Sumar did not seem to have noticed him, and Melik guessed that even if she did, she would not be able to get at him on dry land. The only danger was if she lashed out at him with one of her talons. So long as he kept his distance, Melik reckoned he would be safe. Running to the riverbank, Melik uncoiled the rope he was still clutching in his hands. Here, you two, catch this! Holding on to one end of the rope, he threw the other out into the gooey water. It snaked through the air, slapping down over Richard's shoulder and landed just by Orkin's right hand. <coughs> Suma bellowed in rage and flung herself down into the water. Even as Orkin and Richard grabbed Malik's rope, they felt the surrounding ooze shake. The moss beast was dragging herself towards them. Malik called desperately, feeling for the first time the strength of the goo that held his companions. They seemed to be stuck fast. Kick! Move your legs! He shouted, heaving harder and harder on the rope. Try and loosen the grip of the slime! 
they did as Malik suggested, and first Richard, then Orkin suddenly popped free. Now that they were on its surface, the slime that had previously trapped them came to their aid. As Malik heaved on the rope, they slid easily across the slippery mass, which was by now almost rubbery in consistency. They reached the bank just in time. Where they had been just seconds before rose the monstrous figure of Sumar. A talon streaked out at lightning speed and embedded itself in the bank, narrowly missing Richard's leg. For a moment he stared horrified at the dank, scaly thing. Then it ripped back for a second strike. The three ran as fast as they could. From behind came a chilling shriek of frustration. Then, quite suddenly, there was silence. When they reached a safe distance, they turned around. All was as it had been before. The forest rustled gently in a light breeze. The water was still again. A chain of dark green stones stepped innocently across the river. The air was fresh and wholesome. Gasping for breath, Richard felt the amulet around his neck. Now he recalled Golan's words when he gave it to him. I will be with you. He thought of Golan's voice in his mind earlier, warning him against the stones. Next time he would listen. He would think harder about the prophecy too. He had certainly got the earth below wrong. Richard looked at Malik. I don't know where you found the strength, but you certainly saved our lives. Oh, it was nothing, Malik replied modestly. Quite, Orkin agreed. What do you mean, quite? The dwarf snapped. Now you two, don't start fighting, Richard said quickly. I suggest that we get undercover while we decide where to go from here. We don't want to get caught in the open again. He turned and scanned the clearing. This way, Richard said, heading for a clump of boulders. He reached them first and sat down between two enormous rocks. Malik followed just behind and plumped himself down on the sandy ground. We should be safe here, Richard said breathlessly. Where's Orkin? Malik looked at him in dismay. Cautiously, they peered out from the rocks. There was no sign of Orkin, just a faint wailing in the distance. Nor could they make out any hiding place where Orkin might have holed up. He had simply vanished. And that is the end of book number one. So, how did you go with the Ancestral Challenge? Were you able to find all of the hidden objects? And do you think Suma was based on Scylla or the Nyanya? If you haven't seen the Ancestral Challenge for book number one, you can check it out here and then come on back and see how you go. In the pinned comment below, you'll find a link where you can download the map pieces that came with this issue, as well as instructions on how to print them. So, stay tuned for the next Ancestral Challenge where I'll reveal the answers from this week. And until then, stay skull-brained.